Excellent, thank you. Um, well, it's lovely to be able to join you here from the RNCM Lecture Theatre. I'm the only person in the building, of course, um, and it's a real pleasure. Either that or I could just do this from my office. Um, that would also be fun as well. I've got my, my piano right here. But no, I'm actually um, right at home. So I'm going to do this mostly through slides so you can see the music and listen to what um, I'm, I'm talking about. But because of the nature of this type of online broadcast, the audio excerpts will be short indeed. So I'm going to just quickly, deftly go between the different screens that I have. And I will now screen share with you. And if this works, you will be able to actually see the slides, but you will also be able to see me in the corner. There we go. So uh, note the email address. Um, I've got a feeling we're not actually streaming on YouTube anymore, but if we were um, and people have questions, they could email me that way. So where I'm broadcasting from is actually where I do most of my work at home. This is my standing desk. Um, it was intended, usually I'd be standing maybe two days, uh, two hours a day at most, but for the last seven weeks, I've been standing here for about 10 hours a day. Um, so I want to talk about the nature of performance and composition for me personally before the lockdown and after the lockdown, because as with other composers, performances at the heart of everything that I'm interested in. So to quote Rink in what is quite um, an old book by now, but temporality lies at the heart of performance. It takes place in time. So if it takes place in time, what happens when that notion of time is artificially disembodied? Perhaps more useful is to look at research into ensemble performance. So a lot of work in music psychology can set us up really well for this. And the fact is that when musicians play together, it is a social interaction as much as it is a musical one. Elaine goes on further to talk about these two different types of interactions, that one could be called hunting, um, where people, um, as it says, I'm not going to read out the whole slides, but that's a very kind of non-dynamic form of interaction. And then the second, being more dynamic, involves cooperation, as Goodman puts it, mutual adjustment. I'm particularly fond of this notion, the illusion of synchrony. So in other words, this notion of playing together, playing in time, is a very artificial construct. And for human beings, it's actually impossible. Now, this is something I'm going to get back to later because it's something that preoccupies me in my own work. The fact is that all performers spend so much time trying to get things accurate rhythmically. And yet, as human beings, we cannot even perform crotches accurately. By which I mean, if you were to tap a slow pulse on your mobile phone app and have a look at it, you'll actually see that this speed varies just as our heartbeat does. So this notion of something being accurate is, is not a human condition anyway. So this notion of problem solving, interpersonal dynamics, again, getting back to this idea of something being social is really important. And at the end of my talk, I'm gonna talk about my most recent project where I'm still composing a piece where I'm working with four people that I know really well, and none of the five of us are together at all. We are working completely in a disembodied fashion. So some kind of musical examples immediately. Um, this rather strange ensemble work of mine in which I kind of demonstrate here how, although the vocal line is paramount, it, it's, it's heard, this is all about the very strange interactions of these other instruments, the way that the, the alto recorder bends the pitch of the singer. And the, the sung part is very, very straightforward. It's meant to be, it's completely syllabic. So you, you hear the words, but everything else in terms of performance is trying to kind of shift that, make it sound almost more complex than it is. And indeed it takes over and it kind of echoes the voice. Um, so much of my music is about this idea of, of one idea being reflected within another performance media. Here's the short excerpt.
You might notice at the end of that excerpt as well, it instructs the alter recorder and everyone else to pause if necessary for page terms. Um, everything that I think about composition, I also think practically. I've got pieces where I've actually built in page terms, rather than seeing it as something that, that someone should worry about in performance. I'm interested in any possible way of, of not exactly accommodating the performer, but taking what the performer needs as a compositional idea. Towards the, the end of this short work, um, which is very, very straightforward and indeed, another thing that I play with a lot is this idea of, of constantly moving timbres around. So you have this very simple melody and you will hear that all the other instruments kind of surround the voice almost as if they, they were to add pedal. Um, so in this passage here, for example, you see in green this very simple melody that's kind of echoed in each one of the instruments. But the point of this in live performance gets into another aspect of performance that fascinates me and is also never perfect, which is the notion of intonation. And the point is that a C-sharp is never the same C-sharp. It depends entirely on the context. It depends on the key, if you're writing within a more tonal harmonic language. But even if you're not, notes are different. There is no concept of, of pitches being equally divided. This is a construct. It's something that exists on an instrument like the piano. But even pianists, when they play, are thinking beyond the rigidity of the, note, of the, the actual structure of the instrument itself. So this is something which, of course, performers grapple with all the time, indeed can even frustrate them. And yet it's something that for me is absolutely crucial to the nature of performance. The fact that that C sharp will never be the same twice. At the very end here, again, this very simple scale, it's echoed in all other instruments. And then you get this very simple um, four note chord at the very end, five note chord, final one, and then it changes everything around. And by changing the voices, you're changing the intonation. In other words, what I'm interested in doing is actually writing something which is always going to sound, um, I've got to be very careful with my terminology here, but it will always sound slightly dodgy. And actually in performance, that's one of the aspects of it that I really love. Here's this short excerpt. Course, hopefully it comes over um, the internet, but even the fact that the ultra recorder player will naturally deflect the pitch at the end is the kind of thing that might bother a certain kind of 21st century composer. But for me, it's absolutely perfect. It's what gives it its character. So I'm now going to move on to the last work of mine that was premiered before the lockdown. Um, this was premiered in Glasgow on the 5th of March. And it is the only work I've had performed where I didn't shake the hands of the performers. And um, we did the, the, the elbow bump then, and um, already it was a little bit of a stressful time and you were on trains and we we're worried about that. So there's, there's a, a lot of baggage around this, but the piece was written um, at the end of last year. So in, in a much more tranquil time. Um, the title is Reflecting Instruments, as you can see. I've got a large number of works for ensembles that end with the term instruments. Um, actually, bizarrely, the first one I wrote was called Broken Instruments. So kind of after that, you kind of think you can't go any further, but I, I kept on going. Um, and it shares a lot of 
um, musical similarities with another piece called Resonating Instruments, but that's a whole different type of talk. Um, and it's, it's not what I want to explore briefly today. Instead, I want to explore further this idea of how I'm constantly thinking, sometimes in quite simple ways, I would argue, of how I use performance as a means of generating ideas. I, I can hear someone else, so you might want to make sure that everyone is muted. That'd be great. Um, so this piece begins relatively simple, simply. Um, a lot of my musical ideas are also interested in how I can make musicians play in a way where I'm not in any way arguing that the musical parts are easy, but I'm really interested in this notion of a technical display where sometimes there's something quite natural about it. If you like a kind of natural virtuosity, and I, I play with that very much in this piece. But then I'm also playing with things right in, in the first bars there. So this idea is very physical in terms of performance. The string players will play together. That's very much what string players do. But notice the piano completely muted. You won't even hear it. In other words, it's a resonance of what the strings are doing. So immediately at the beginning, you can see there's a reflection of the strings in the piano. And that relationship is going to constantly change. But it's also playing with this notion of live performance. So when I get onto the current piece where I'm composing for people literally living in, in different cities, one of the things that I miss immensely about isolation is not just the sound of musicians playing together, but the sounds of the resonances mixing together. Um, and I know it sounds like such a simple thing to talk about, but it's one of the things that I think is, is missing in all these very wonderful um, Facebook videos that we see of whole orchestras and, and opera companies kind of playing together with a click track. I'm not in any way demeaning it. I'm just aware of, in some senses, what an artificial construct it is. Because so much about performance is about performers reacting. And I go further and I say that so much of composition is about composers thinking about that reaction and thinking about how they, in their own way, negotiate with that. So I've got short clips of the very opening. I'll talk about a few passages and I'll, I'll put the opening 30 seconds together. So here's the first system. So hopefully even over the audio on Zoom, you get this impression. And so at the very end there, the pits in orange, the piano is still subjugated. It's still not quite part of the action. Now, almost immediately, these relationships start to, to move around. So again, this idea of, of intonation. So you have a, a plucked D the, in the violin. The, the kind of the timbre that it has will affect the way we perceive the pitch. When you then put that with a, a natural harmonic on, um, on, on the cello, again, it's going to have a very specific kind of sound. Actually, it's not a natural harmonic, it's, it's misnotated, it's a, an artificial one. But the point is you're, you're going to have all these different types of frequencies. That's then taken over here by a violin, natural harmonic. So again, it's based very much on, on the string itself, a different kind of timbre and you get this constant interplay between the two. Then at the end, you can see this idea comes back, but instead of now the piano being a resonance, it becomes more physical. It begins to kind of have an identity, if you like. So you begin to hear just a little bit more there. And then here in green, for the first time now, you get the attack of the piano actually starting the gesture. Now I can play that again. And you begin to hear how it's a very, very different kind of sound. Oh, sorry, I might need to go to something else. And um, the fact is that those sounds will never quite play together. Here you can hear it. Now, this was an Anhai trio, they're a really good trio, but any trio will know getting something like that 
absolutely together. And um, the, the piano, because of its attack, is never going to quite mix with the strings, and especially in this kind of very isolated situation. Um, now, as, a, as both a performer, but as a composer, that's one of the things that really excites me about this musical interaction. So here's that first 30 seconds in context. So that gives you a taste of the various ideas that over the next 20 minutes or so are going to be kind of thrown around and uh, thrown around and developed in different ways. Um, a lot of my music over the last 30 years indeed has been interested in this whole idea, not only of the transference of sound from one timbre to another, but of how attacks can be used in various ways. In this passage, for example, um, again, this notion of the performability. So, at this speed, the sextuplet in the piano on the second beat is never going to conform to the triplet, um, which is being played in a measured tremolo on the violin, even though they are technically the same rhythms. Um, the strummed three note chord and then the four note chord in the cello, again, it adds to the texture. It kind of complements what's going on, but there's this constant kind of sense of being mismatched. Going on to some other kind of very natural ideas. Um, for me, the, the nature of instruments is crucial to my compositional process. And, and in some respects, even some very simple things, things that give the instrument its character. So here in purple, the E string of the violin, um, actually one of my favorite strings of any string instrument, it's immutable. It's, um, it, it, it always is what it is, especially loud. Um, and I build that into what's happening harmonically, which I don't need to, to go into the details of, but it's, it's actually really important to the way I work. Then if you notice the relationship between the violin and the cello, they're playing at the start in the same kind of area in terms of pitch, but the timbres are different. They're, they're mismatched. Again, tuning um, is, is difficult and is challenging. Of course, the, the tremolando, of course, is worth comment because what tremolando does, or any more rapid bowing, is it adds noise to the sound. It adds more noise to, to pitch. And that's something that for me, again, as a feature, I'm really interested in how these things com combine. <laughs> Again, I'm not sure if the, the, the kind of stridency of the E string comes out there, but it's something that I really enjoy. And here we have a return of that opening idea with the piano now becoming more and more strident. <laughs> And so on. Still, though, we have moments of resonance, so returning to the opening here, the strings really playing loudly and the piano emerging in terms of the resonance. And this interplay keeps on going on in different ways. I talked about the open E string and just open strings in general and open strings on natural harmonics as well. These kinds of sounds are of, of great interest to me. And um, if you see the, the second pluck note in the, in the cello, that's a G just below the previous A. It's a very different type of timbre. It's a more muted timbre, slightly percussive. And this constant mixing of, how can I put this really uh, kind of diplomatically? These are often things that performers will do their best to circumvent. So when a cellist plays that, they will be thinking correctly that these two pitches, the A and the G, should be as equal as possible. But, and I, I, I know there's some cellists in the room, it will never be equal. It will never be the same because the octave harmonic on the A is going to speak in a completely different way. It will be much louder. The string just resonates more. So 
I'm not in any way suggesting to performers that they just don't worry about all this stuff. I actually want them to fight. And, and that's part of why I write this way. I'm really thinking about how these sounds combine. <laughs> I hope you heard just how much the, the E string twanged there. It, it really is one of my, my one of my favorite sounds. I'm going to get onto a violinist later called Tom Kemp, and he always calls the E string a cheese wire or a cheese cutter because it, it kind of is. You know, you can, I can see some of you laughing. That's that's nice. Um, but yeah, it's, it just has this wonderful kind of twangy um, quality. Okay, I just want to put these thirty seconds into context. <laughs> Acoustic phenomenon. Um, I'm not an acoustician. Um, I think Michelle's here, so I'll be very careful. But sometimes when you take these sounds and you superimpose them, you get natural detunings. So at some points there, I'm not sure how much it comes over on the Zoom recording, but the piano begins to sound out of tune. Now, believe me, it wasn't, but it's the way our ears kind of will bend to what's there. The example I give, I, I don't have a slide for this, um, not in this PowerPoint anyway, but the opening of um, Ligeti's Hamburg Concerto, I see Joseph laughing. Um, the opening of Ligeti's Hamburg Concerto is this wonderful passage where you have these horns playing in natural harmonics and they're all out of tune and they're playing a Lydian pentachord in D flat. And then what does he do? But he brings in the wind section playing the same notes. That's never, going to be in tune. Now, it's the most amazing sound. Um, so, so these kinds of things really, really interest me. Um, much of what you've heard is, is quite aggressive at the moment. It's, it's a, a kind of virtuosic display, if you like. There are these moments you, say, you see here in green, something more melodic begins to emerge in this trio, but always being kind of negotiated with other more kind of rough and aggressive sounds. In orange, the way that the, the very kind of natural strumming, again, you know, I write a triplet, it's never going to be an exact triplet. E even the, the semiquavers later in the cello, I, I kind of, I've worked enough with, with, with cellos just to know how it's going to sound. And it's that slightly random nature of it that I really, really enjoy. Then in blue here, this is a, a tremolo on, on the same harmonic on, on the D string, where it kind of begins to interfere with a more sedate melody in the violin. <laughs> All the while, these sounds begin to move around. So there you have now um, artificial harmonics in the cello and the same register as the violin. It's a very different sound. You'll hear it. I mean, I, I always say to, to other composers as well when we're talking about this, we don't ever use artificial harmonics because we want high notes. The cello can easily play that C an octave higher on the A string. It's because of the timbre. We want that kind of mix of timbres. And not only does the, the timbre differ, but so does the, the tuning, the intonation, the expressivity. Everything about that I'm fascinated in playing with. There's a, a very simple idea as well for the, the high major third and the, the piano is kind of taken from the harmonics and the strings. So moving on to a slightly more kind of scherzo-like section, again playing, this is, is, is some of the simplest writing of the piece, but these open strings again on the violin, really, really important to the character. <laughs> Now, if you listened, you might have noticed, I'll just move my, my mouse there, you can say that. This one, because it's played in a different position, suddenly sounds a little bit bad compared to the other ones around it. But again, that's very much the way I'm thinking. I, I enjoy that, I like it. Here we get more of these. Notice that I'm actually quite kind here. I write approximate rhythm. And, and I, it's kind of funny if you think about it that someone should write approximate rhythm over semiquavers. But that's kind of what happens because, you know, 
there's a the instrument is there the, the, the cellist moves that's that's what i want um and it, it... so i'll put that little short passage in context Those, uh, especially the, the plucked harmonics, especially when it's the two octave harmonic, they sound very percussive indeed. They're, they're really meant to. Other things that I miss in the disembodied ensemble environment that we find ourselves in, things like this, where just for me, the, the joy of a resonant large piano, as it dies away, you notice these other sounds. It's, there's a lot of this kind of oral camouflage in this work. You hear these massive kind of sustained sounds as they die away. And you'll see that I've, I've, I've asked for the, I'll just mark it there. That means that the, the pianist has to kind of gradually lift the pedal. As the sound dissipates, you hear the other things around it here as well. So you, you might have heard the second low um, dyad that you get in the piano. It's almost as if the violins are harmonic to it. And then here, the harmonics kind of move between different instruments. So you get that kind of oral interplay. Um, a more dramatic kind of juxtaposition of the sound of the piano with the strings. Here, it's the complete opposite to the beginning. The piano is just playing very, very simple notes, really loud, sustained. And then you just get this kind of blanket of sound emerging from the strings. And again, thinking about, you know, why I write for particular notes. A lot of the time it has nothing to do necessarily with how I'm thinking harmonically, although that's always there somewhere. It's about the instruments as well. So I wanted that low cello C because it is the low cello C. I'm not even using it because, well, I just want an open string to make it slightly kind of easier. It's because I want that particular sound. So, so these things are really important. An example of where I'm interested in what I could call a more elusive virtuosity. In other words, things which are difficult, but don't sound maybe quite as difficult as they are. So here, both the violin and the cello are playing double unisons. Um, and you get this sound, which for me is unbelievable. It's, it's so intense. And it's like the instruments change. Um, in, in composition pedagogy, I often say to other composers, when you're writing double stops for strings, unless you've got an open string, it's a real mistake to think of it as, oh, I'm writing for two strings. You're not. You're not writing for two violins when you have a double stop. It, it changes the sound, it changes the timbre. So here, it's not about having the sound of two violins. It's about having a really weird violin and a really weird cello. And frankly, it's difficult for them to play in tune. Then at the end of that section in orange, um, I have this very simple unison where the piano is playing softly and then the two um, strings are playing exactly the same sound, very intense, very loud. And then here, the roles have been reversed. So the piano here live is just adding resonance. It changes the sound, but it's this kind of very intense sound of the, the tetrachords that you get in the strings which really dominates. And then they all kind of fold together and we end with this kind of D unison, but D unison in different ways. So you have the piano, you have um, two D unisons um, on the violin, the violin playing the open string and the G string, and even a harmonic D unison on the cello. So you've got five Ds kind of mixing at the same time. Here's this really strange passage. <laughs> 
I've got a solo cello piece I wrote about a decade ago, but there's a whole passage where the cellist is playing this really intense melody in double unison. And when the cellist first saw it, they, they asked me if, they, if I was crazy. And I suppose I am a little bit, but um, the sound of it really sticks with me. I just absolutely love the intensity of it. Other things I, I really like, here you have a, a broken unison. <clears throat> That's sometimes what I call it. So it's a very simple one, one line melody now, as you can see, the piano is playing all of the notes, but then you've got this odd kind of sound in the violoncello where they're kind of interleaving and often playing harmonics, again, because it's slightly strange and slightly unusual. So you get this really odd kind of sound here. Now, one piece that I often talk about that does something similar to this is an ensemble work by Oliver Nussman called Coursing. And the first minute, um, beginning on an E flat, among the 16 instruments, kind of weaves among them. So not everyone plays all the time. But I've been thinking about this recently. And although I love that piece and it's inspired me in other works, that's not the inspiration for this idea. It comes from a very different kind of piece. And this is an example of a piece that even when you listen on an excellent recording, although there's one actually that works quite well, even on an excellent recording, we will never hear it the way the composer intended unless it's live. So it's the last movement of um, the Pathetic Symphony by Tchaikovsky. It's lovely, Berlin Phil, yeah, fantastically played. Actually, part of the problem is it's so well played, we don't really hear what's going on here. And what Tchaikovsky writes is a melody that's discombobulated. So notice it goes between the violin two and the violin one, and even the counter melody cello between the viola. I mean, it's extraordinary writing. Um, uh, it's always dangerous to say this is the first time. Um, it's the first time unless we go to medieval hocketing technique, which is not dissimilar, I suppose, in some ways. It's the first piece I can think of that does this. And it's entirely psychological. They can never play this melody because the melody goes between them. And, you know, in, in, in the context of this particular piece, that's really beautiful. And there is one bit, just one bit, where suddenly the violins one have the line. And it's, it's, it's almost kind of achingly, um, Kind of unbearable. So I continue this idea. I'll, I'll, sorry to go back from Tchaikovsky to, to Horn, but um, here, for instance, this kind of very simple idea, just kind of marking the crotchets here, but with these wonderful harmonics, you know, that just completely change the sound. So you get, it's a really, really strange passage. <laughs> So this is quite kind of reminds me of Tchaikovsky and that what I wanted was this kind of disembodied sound. I mean, the, the, the pianist is trying really hard to play a, a beautiful legato. And of course, as any pianist knows that the piano doesn't do legato, it's, it's not its thing. And, and so it's been kind of interrupted all the time by these wonderful harmonics. Here in the green passage, um, very simple minor tetrachord, but you have the overlapping now of the strings. So the strings are actually adding pedal to the piano sound. 
And so on the whole passage here as well gets even higher, finally ending on that D again. The, the piece often comes back to D. Um, and actually, why the D? Because it's such a great note, because you can play it in so many different ways. It's a little bit like um, the question, why does the very violin sequence begin on A? Because you can play it on three strings. You know, you can't do that for B flat. That's why it's not going to um, begin on a B flat. So here's this little kind of odd unison passage. So towards the, the end of the work, um, obviously I'm, I'm not intending to, to play the whole thing, it's, it's not the right kind of forum for that, but other ways where I begin to kind of interfere with the sounds of the ensemble. So the piano's playing these kind of, kind of clattering chords in the higher register, and what these harmonics are doing is they begin to interfere with that, they, they put it out of tune, they, they change the texture, and um, even these little gestures, so you, you barely hear that little scale, but it's kind of almost like it's reacting with the piano's gesture. And then towards the very end of the piece, this kind of melody that's kind of gone throughout comes back and it's kind of quite unadulterated. You have it here played in unison, the, the piano and the violin, and then the very end, it just kind of almost like water going down the plug hole. It's like the whole piece just kind of goes into that A. So this is most of my talk done now to give you a, a little bit of sense of timing. So I just want to talk for the last five minutes or so about what I'm writing at this moment. Um, I'm not sure, I, I think I've, I've done that kind of thing a few times, but generally, at least in research forms, we often talk about either a piece we're going to write or a piece that we've written. But um, it's a bit unfair if you think about it because my composition students are always having to show me pieces that are not finished. So I think it's fair that I should have to do something similar. Um, so this is a provisional title. Um, and of course, there's a lot of irony in that, in that sense that how can instruments be intimate when they're not together? So I'm writing it for a quartet of good friends of mine. We go back, in some cases, two decades. Now, although they've individually either played my music, in one case they've conducted it. Um, I've never actually written a piece for this particular quartet, but I work with them so much. Um, we've been working in the Sound of Music Summer School as, as the main kind of instrumental group for the last 11 years. I, I know their sound intimately. I, I know how they play together. I, um, and, and because every year I'm, I'm, I'm kind of educating 15 young composers to write for this quartet, um, we must have, I don't know, premiered about 200 pieces by now. It's, it's, it's quite extraordinary. So in one way, writing this work is actually quite easy in the, when I'm sitting at my, well, sorry, when I'm standing at my desk, um, I, I, I completely get their sounds. I, I, I know what's going to happen. But what I wanted to do with this was I wanted to actually write the piece understanding the bizarre nature in which it would be played. So I've just started. Um, what I have may not even be the piece, but I was interested in thinking about how the ensemble will work in different ways, together, separately, and how actually in the study of, of the rehearsal process, we will kind of learn things. I'll, I'll, I'll probably think about how I even change the compositional process. And um, so this is, this is kind of 
So that's my Cougar clock. And um, I'm not sure if you can actually pick it up. Can you? All right. <laughs> I was going to go another three times. Um, so this is literally the last couple of days of work. Um, at this desk here, there's, there's Tom um, at home in Tunbridge Wells. Um, hopefully he's not disgusted. Um, so we've got all the setup here. Here's Hannah. Um, she's living in southwest London. Now let me talk a little bit about the idea for this first part of the piece. Um, I thought I'd start with the cello. Um, Richard Harwood and I go back a long, a long time, about, about 20 years. Absolutely fantastic cellist. He, he can just play anything. Um, he just, in fact, it doesn't seem like he could ever put his finger in the wrong place. It's, it's really, really amazing. Um, but I was then thinking, okay, maybe I record him first. And that's what I did, in fact. And then the next person I worked with was actually the flute player, and then the clarinetist, and then the violinist. And so we recorded it in different ways. Now, as you've seen on social media, it's really easy to play with a click track if you're used to doing it. And with good editing, um, you can make it sound terrific. And um, on purpose, if I just go back, you can see that my editor is Audacity. And I have to tell you, it's absolutely fantastic. It's so easy to use. It, it, it's just, it's completely malleable. I love it. And, and you really feel that you can kind of move the sounds. But the thing is, I realized I could do anything with this. I, I can clip, I can edit. Um, it, it's, it's kind of going against the nature of actually what I'm trying to do here. So all of the stuff I've been talking about before, about this idea of people kind of bouncing off each other in terms of pitch, in terms of ideas, in terms of gestures, you can see all these things are kind of misaligned in a way that makes it really easy playing for click track. Um, so I was thinking about that a little bit, how we do that, but all these kind of things where, where pitches come together. So this, this F sharp, then the E, and then notice here, if I just circle it, the cello, that's a, a, an E, um, major third, major sixth harmonic, it's the same pitch, and it's always in terms of intonation going to be odd, and that's doubled with the flute. Um, so all of this stuff that I've kind of talked about a little bit in the trio is, is still there, just with a, a different kind of group. So about how all these sounds assess themselves, but all of the players, apart from Richard, already had his recordings. So they would sometimes record it listening to him and sometimes recording it just with a click track. Um, and as I added each new layer, so finally when Tom was doing this yesterday afternoon, he was actually able to play with the trio. So that for me is really interesting and that's probably going to kind of inform my, my thinking as I, I keep on going with this. I'm, I'm not sure if it's going to be a multi-movement work where each movement is kind of trying to deal with something different, or if I'll kind of through compose that. And um, here you'll see that the cello dominates, it's the main thing. And then you start to get a little bit of very simple kind of free notation where they're repeating passages. This, by the way, is the easiest thing in the world to edit. I mean, if you just want to stop it or you want to make it a bit longer, um, I was actually a little bit shocked at how straightforward it was. So finally, each of those other three instruments, they kind of disintegrate and they're, they're doing their stuff. Um, cello's just going at it really, really intense, and then it stops. So, so that's it. It's, it's only about 90 seconds. It's over the last two days we've, we've been working on this. Um, but the rehearsal process is also what I'm documenting, and it's really amazing. The questions that are coming up, um, the different ways that we can effectively work. Um, also because, you know, no one planned for the lockdown. So, you know, some of the performers have actually quite decent mics and um, others just have a smartphone. But as many of you know, smartphones are pretty good recorders. Um, but it's learning where to place it. Also the rooms, um, you know, where, where you record yourself in a particular part of the room, it makes, it makes a massive difference. And the thing is for most of us, we're, we're not, you know, we're not recording engineers or sound technicians. We, we don't understand this. So there's a, there's a lot of messiness in, in this process as well. But um, I have to tell you, and you know, it'll sound a little bit kind of gratuitous at the end of the talk, but the really amazing thing about the last two days was seeing my friends again. And, and that was really, really moving. As, as I was writing the piece, I was composing it, I knew I was writing for friends, but to actually see them was, was really, really moving. And um, so as you've already discovered, it's a little bit messy when you get lots of people together on Zoom, 
but um, we will be doing that as well. But at the moment, over the last two days, it's just been you know two people at a time, me, another performer. So here it is, um, the world premiere of a piece or the beginning of a piece that may not even exist. I mean, that's, I think that's pretty good going actually for a research forum. Um, so we'll, we'll see how it goes, but here it is. <laughs> just what it is, it's just an ending. Um, but as I say, the, the experience of just putting that together over the last couple of days has been really amazing. And, um, and a very odd one for me, of course, because usually as a composer, I go into the room with the players for the first time, we, we put it all together in an ensemble. That can be actually wonderfully messy. But to do it this way has really given some, some interesting insights. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning with some of those references, some of this is actually quite old scholarship now, but actually, Still, as simple as some of it is, it's really, really fascinating and, and certainly chimes with a lot of my own thoughts. So thank you very much indeed. And I'll be very happy to take some questions. And I'm also going to come out of sharing screen. And there we are. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, David. Um, but I think we shall give you a clap first of all, OK? <laughs> you can see that. Um, first of all, I want to, to apologize for inadvertently creating my own um, premiere. Um, and Michelle Phillips has given it a title. She's called it Lockdown Looping. Um, so I think we're all on a, a sort of learning curve. And I wasn't trying to upstage David Horn. I certainly didn't <laughs> in, in um, the confusing start to this. I guess we're, we're all learning as we go. It's fantastic to hear about your recent work. Um, including the Reflecting Instruments, which had it, was lucky to have its um, premiere in Glasgow just before that shutdown. I remember hearing about your, your trip there. Um, and I also like the phrase very much from, the, from Tchaikovsky to Horn. You said, <laughs> I love that, the way, the way that came in. Um, just to say that any YouTube listeners who are with us just now can send an email to David Horn, and he's given his email address um, in the, at the beginning of the presentation. Um, we're very happy to, to deal with questions that way. People who are with us on Zoom can, um, can ask questions and unmute yourself while you ask your question. I'll try and police it if I can get the right view on, on, the, on the Zoom. But just, um, just to say that this idea of work in progress or research in pro progress, you've really gone to the heart of that. Um, it's uh, th by showing us an unfinished piece, a piece that is responding to the very unexpected and exceptional circumstances. I'm obviously very interested in, in music and composers and performers who in the past have responded to, to wars or to unexpected um, um, events. And, and it's lovely to, well, it's fascinating to get an insight um, and to, to hear about your experience of, of lockdown and how it's um, it required you to change how you work and how you compose. So I'd like to um, open it up to, to everyone. I'm gonna try, ah, I think I can see most people. If you can give me, I think you have to do um, um, a reaction of um, hand, a hand up. Is that possible, that reaction? 
How do we do that? You can only get a wave or a thumbs up. Will we do thumbs up? Will that work? Hello? You can hear me, can you? David? Yeah, yeah well, also, okay. I'm Right, so no. that will work. So who, um, Nick Rayland seems to have our first question. No, he's got a thumbs up, just saying that he agrees with me. So let's use thumbs up now to indicate that you'd like to, to ask a question and wave as well. And between the two, we will get there. So who would like to start us off? Adam. Adam, please. Hello, David. That was fantastic. It was great to hear those pieces. Um, I, I remember Harrison Birtwistle once saying that all of his all of his pieces were just extended monodies. I wonder what your relationship and your feelings about monodies are and how you develop them. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it's one thing in Birtwistle's music that, that really interests me, um, and any other composers like that as well. I'm, I'm essentially quite a monodic composer, um, which isn't to say that I don't think about counterpoint. I, I certainly bang on about it enough, but um, yeah, I, I, I generally think of, of like one thing and then how everything else kind of circles around that and informs it. Yeah, because the, the, that, the word monody, the word hocket, and the word um, heterophony, kept, I kept thinking of those words and listening to those pieces just there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, hetero heterophony, hocketing, all of that kind of stuff, very much what I'm interested in. I suppose it's this idea that when you take a line going in that direction and you start playing with the colour as well, that it, it, it adds a, a whole argument. Um, it, although we didn't have time to play the whole piece, in fact, what happens with that um, monodic section is I then do add a counterpoint. And, and for me, that gets really exciting. So it's almost like this game, like a puzzle, where you've got these two lines and the signs keep on changing. So it, I, I do enjoy that. It's a little bit like, I was talking about this the other day, the, the Nankara piece, where it begins very kind of fast and high, slow and low, and then the two hands start going like this. And so it's kind of terrifying because at the end, you know, it's gonna be unmanageable because it's gonna be loud and low and fast. Um, and in a way, I find that when you've got a monody, when you start changing the color, it adds a new energy. So that when you've got a contrapuntal line, it's not two lines. You see what I mean? Thank you. Barbara's muted. Wait, Anna, Anna. Hello. Um, firstly, thank you so much, David. That was absolutely brilliant. And uh, yeah, just give me so many ideas. Um, and has given me faith in Zoom for the first time. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just really loved hearing your work in progress. I was thinking a bit similar to Adam saying about Bert Wessel and Extended Monody. Um, I just want to throw in another quote from Lachenman about composing means building an instrument. And I wonder whether for you, um, you actually build the piece from the instruments rather than building the instrument and then building the piece? Or do you think you also really select your canvas and then build the piece? Yeah, I mean, although I, obviously I, I, I I think my music sounds very different to Lark and Man. I'm, I'm not that far away in a funny way aesthetically. It's just that for me, the so, so all these kind of very simple things like harmonics and plucked harmonics, I, I tend to use a relatively limited palette of, of those sounds. Um, and as a result, that kind of builds its own instrument. Um, I mean, I, th there are some problems perhaps with that approach in that the individual parts in the trio, for example, are, are not immediately, from a performance perspective, grateful. In, in that I think it's quite hard sometimes for the performers to see where the line is. Um, it's not the first time, actually. Quite a, a few performers have sometimes said to me um, after they played a piece, oh, when I was playing through the part, I thought it was really rubbish. <laughs> and, and one of the reasons, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, but... <laughs> Um, I mean, they might think it's rubbish after, after as well, but it, it, it is the fact that the individual parts sometimes won't make much sense. Um, can we have Sam Duffy next, please? Hi, this is me. Um, can you all hear me? Yes, easy. Hi, so I'm Sam, I'm from uh, PRISM. So um, I'm the centre manager there, so I'm not doing research at the moment, but actually my doctoral research before um, was actually on remote music tuition. So bizarrely, I'm now being deluged by questions and I've, I've actually been writing some blog articles on LinkedIn. The one I'm writing at the moment is exactly what you talked about today, about how 
it's easy to be fooled by all these Zoom performances online at the moment about it's actually okay to perform together. And, and as we all know, and you beautifully illustrated, there's so much to think about. Um, I was really interested in what you were saying about how, um, and I wonder if you could just elucidate on this a little bit more about your practice, how you would how you would compose with a rehearsal as opposed to building up layers. Because I was literally thinking about this last night, thinking about well, instead of everybody recording their piece separately, so click, why aren't we trying to do something like build it up in layers? So one, if it was a jazz ensemble, you, you lay down drums and send it to the bass player, then send the two on to somebody else and get a response somehow. And you, you actually bang that right on the head. So could you say a little bit more about how that differs to how you usually do it? That'd be amazing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I mean, you're, you're right. Look, what I've, this first at 90, 90 seconds, is done exactly like that. I was thinking, okay, how will I put this all together? And actually it was very easy, but I couldn't write the whole piece like that. And so while I don't know yet exactly what I'm gonna do next, I'm really interested in all these problems about the things that we cannot do so well and how we get over them. Um, you see, as I said, even with audacity, I mean, I feel like God, I, I can change anything. It, it's like, you know, if, if, if it's a bit flat or soft or something, I just bump it up. It's, it's easy. It's, it's, it's just ludicrous. But of course, that's, that's not live performance. And so at the moment, I think this was kind of getting my feet wet and just, just to see how it was going to work. Um, but I want to be more challenging. I, I want to think about the idea of playing as an ensemble when you're disembodied, which is... I loved what you talked about, about pitch specifically, because I've been thinking more about um, rhythm and actually what you said about deliberate intonation mistakes, if you like, or bends or an artistic intonation change that then others in the group respond to. That's something else which you're never going to get if people aren't hearing each other. I thought that was really fascinating. So I, I, I'd love to know more as you carry on with the experiment. Absolutely. I mean, the, the other interesting thing, I, I just saw Jenny's concept about Gamelan as well, and that's that's fascinating, uh, really interesting. Um, it, it, this is short as well. And, and one of the things, don't get me wrong, I, I'm, I understand. I mean, I, I've enjoyed watching all these videos. And of course, for a lot of them, they're in desperate situations. And so it's, it's almost unbearable. I mean, you're looking at the Met video. I mean, the Met could go out of business. Um, we don't we don't know. I mean, it's, it's really serious. And so in a way, it's heartwarming. But the other thing is they're very short. And, and, and so while I don't tend to write really long pieces, usually a piece for me is 15 to 20 minutes, and I'd expect it to be played all the way through. And so for me, a real challenge is going to be, will that ever be possible in lockdown? And if it isn't, then, then that's going to be another unnatural thing for me to deal with. There's another aspect as well that um, the editor, so again, something I don't think a lot of people realise is that there is an editor behind the scenes who has to stitch all these individual performances together. He becomes another member of the group who's essentially mixing, mastering and putting together an interpretation, deciding on the balance of what he gets back. And that also has, has a really big impact. It's another creative input to what the outcome might be. We, we got, our, there was a really amazing email from one of her postgraduate students because when we were looking at all the forms of alternative assessments, the really hard ones were the practical ensemble ones. Um, and in the consort singing one, for example, we were toying with the idea of, oh, well, you've got all these great a cappella videos and um, could you do that? And the student said, no, because that's not going to be in any way assessing us and what we've actually learned. In other words, you know, those, those videos are all about really slick editing but they don't in any way kind of reflect the kind of the musical, the rubato, the to and fro. And I thought that was, you know, and we ended, of course, not offering that. We had to do something um, different. But yeah, that's the thing. At the current time, there's some kinds of music making which are literally impossible. Um, uh, it's not a word that we like to use very much, but, but it's true. And, and actually, in, in very fundamentally simple ways, I mean, we've got lots of piano students at the moment who are practicing on an electronic piano. We've got, I've got a harpsichord student who doesn't have a harpsichord. You know, that they're suddenly confronted with being in an impossible situation, not just an inconvenience, but you know, the students want to keep on learning. And yet here they have this utter kind of, you know, I'm worried about if my washing machine breaks down. But you know, what, what, what if you what if you get a crack on on the viola or some of like that? You can't you can't just take it around the corner. 
So, so a lot of musicians are going to find themselves really battling with this situation. Thank yeah, you. Thank, thank you very much. That was really, really insightful. I really enjoyed that. Thanks very much. Just to just say, I'm about to introduce Larry, but but Larry, um, the, some of the things you were saying about the role of the editor, bringing things together and being another creative person, well, that happens in, in radio and, and television in creating the programmes. And I, I guess Larry has given us a, a great example of, of um, learning that skill in, in, in that particular context. Anyway, Larry, over to you with your um, question. Hi, David. Thank you very much for your presentation. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I was um, I was going to ask about uh, yeah thanks Barbara it's a it's been a steep learning curve. Um, I was going to ask about I love your description of the combining resonances of in instruments and missing that is that something that is really easy to symp sympathize with but quite hard to codify. And I was wondering most of the things that you spoke about in your piece that have been played in more conventional circumstances. Um, exploited real subtleties of interaction and performance and of resonance and of combination. And I was wondering if you're finding with your piece written remotely, if it's leading you to explore much less subtle areas of performer sort of practice and, and possibly interaction or resonance or those instrumental qualities where so much has been compromised by the way we're working. Yeah, I mean, all, almost inevitably. I mean, yeah, I absolutely miss that. Um, the, the way we're working, of course, is even though we're using Zoom, um, I'm not judging the sound on Zoom. So what we've been doing is we were kind of emailing ourselves all the time. So I'll be here, they'll record something, then they'll immediately just email it to me. So in that sense, it's been a, it's been a relatively high quality audio, but you're absolutely right. All those things that in a rehearsal of a quartet, I would kind of revel in are kind of lost. and. Um, I can recreate it from memory, but then I, I don't feel like I'm doing something different. And I don't want to just write a piece based on what I remembered of how an ensemble sounds, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, yeah, relative quality is the key term in these circumstances, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Larry. Um, can we have Simon Clark, please? Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm enjoying this revival of Celebrity Squares, at least the view that I have, redolent of the 80s. Yeah. Um, I want to ask a question that, um, uh, that we've discussed uh, in advance, and so I have a sense of what you may say, but I think it may be pertinent, um, which is to say, um, what would you say is the, the substance of works such as these, or this work in particular, in the metaphysical sense, which is to say, what's constant and endures uh, given that, uh, what's the thisness of the piece, given that it's designed never to be uh, identical to itself? And in a certain sense, that means where is the piece? As in where? As in, in your mind, uh, in, its, in a given instantiation? Yeah, I mean, obviously, one hopes that at some point we will no longer be in lockdown. Um, I don't know when that might be, but one hopes. But let's say the whole piece is created within this environment. Then that for me is completely artificial that what being a composer is about normally has been completely su supplanted um, and in terms of the artificiality yeah absolutely um like i said I, the, the editing process um just moving things around kind of worried me a little bit because i suddenly realized that all those things that might have bothered me in, in live performances i could suddenly tweak but then i realized well that kind of defeats the purpose of what I'm interested in, which is I actually, I like that danger in performance. So maybe to answer your question, the substance is not the piece so much as this physical act of its performance, people being there, people being out of tune, people trying to be in tune, if, if that makes sense. Interesting. Um, Jeff Thomason, I think, was putting his hand up. Jeff? Can you unmute yourself? Hi, David. I was fascinated by the first piece because I am actually a recorder player as well as a clarinetist. And I was really interested in the way that you were exploiting the fact you could produce the same note using different fingerings and getting different colorings. And it struck me there's a great potential here for writing new music for historic wind instruments and exploiting that sense of slightly out of tune, slightly different colour that's actually built into the instrument. 
Because it's a great question. You just hold on a second. I need to get something to show you. Hang on. Does anyone know any jokes? So, unfortunately, my treble recorder is in my office. But I do have my desk cam. Mm. And so well, I actually have a sopranino next to me here. <laughs> it's going to turn into something else, I think. <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the opening of the piece, but using the treble. So, and then all, I, I, I mean, everyone in my generation played recorders, so I actually, yeah. I think it's Jeff Mark, um, and so I, I wrote the whole piece on the recorder, um, and I loved it, and um, it's, it's not unusual, and um, so Chris Orton, you'll know very well, yeah. and I mean, he came over to the Heart Conference, and he played this amazing by Georgia Teddy, which was just, I mean, th there are modern, and um, uh, Thomas Samaku from York, he's got the most amazing recorder piece. So the, it's a thing, actually. Um, and of course, you know, even with composers, more kind of mainstream composers like George Benjamin, uh, writing for vials and stuff like that. Um, th there are, there's a couple of continental European based chamber groups that play on historic instruments, but they play contemporary music. And it's absolutely a thing. And I do like, like it. I mean, also, I, I mean, with the recording of that ensemble, it's a small ensemble, so it's not difficult to balance. But I actually really like, again, the difficulty. Um, but I, I, I say I'm, I'm, I'm a bit strange. You see, I not only have one, but I've got two concertos for glass harmonica. And most people can't claim to even have one. And the thing is, I wrote it for a glass harmonica player, uh, both of them, without amplification. So it's kind of like, I don't know, it's like a, a sheet of toilet paper, as rare as they are nowadays. But it's like a, a sheet of toilet paper compared to like a massive book in terms of the dynamic range. So, so Jeff, a lot of composers are interested. I mean, you, you're probably aware of that. So a lot of composers yep. really like it. Um, and I think it's especially that, to, to be honest, I'm actually more interested probably in mixing the old and the new rather than having all old. Mm. We've had some it calls for some um, recorder ensemble, I think, of, of um, various things on the chat, but we'll, we'll move on and we'll spare you that. Okay, Jane Ginsburg. Jane, can you unmute? Actually, David's made all the points that I was going to make. I was just going to reel off a list of, of, of pieces by contemporary composers for recorder ensemble. Um, it's an, and, and hand bells and uh, you know I'm thinking of uh, John Turner has commissioned a lot of pieces so I was I was just going to stick my oar in actually while David was going to get his recorder but did you see Anna's by the way she has a big one or maybe she was just holding it very close to the screen oh I, we didn't I didn't see that but uh, Amanda thinks she will win the prize for the most the greatest number of of um, recorders but uh, we're, we're getting distracted <laughs> just great. So do, I have a tenor in my office as well. It was a birthday gift from Simon Clark. Okay. In my office. Well, it, perhaps maybe we need a research forum on, on the potential of, um, I don't know, recorder ensemble in the current period. Um, do we have Joseph? Is, is Joseph, did you have your hand up? No? Okay, so any other questions? I'm sure we must have some more. Uh, okay. Jack um alex and jack as well hi david um really enjoyed that thank you um just thinking about um i was thinking about what you were kind of saying at the beginning um and i thought it was just really interesting how um you know you kind of mentioned that like sort of no two c sharps would ever be the same for example um and i wondered how far that could actually be taken you know whether um well, if that's true, then actually, if you you know played something on two completely different instruments and so on and so forth, and whether that could be taken to a point where, whilst we're in sort of a state now of, of lockdown, I mean, it's quite likely that obviously we're not just going to be kind of released in into the world, as it were. Things will happen in stages. So I wonder whether there's scope for music that allows for music to be played, you know, two you know, five meters apart and two and then you know and then two meters apart and then with sort of four players and five players and then ten players and incorporating all those different things it's, it's a really good question and actually before lockdown there are many composers who are really interested in spatialization 
Uh, Bert Whistle was, was mentioned. I mean, he's written quite a few pieces where the whole point is an ensemble is split apart. Um, and there's, there's lots of different examples of that. Um, I also, gosh, the things you see in social media. So I saw an image the other day of a scientific experiment to show that the stuff that comes out of a bassoon when you're playing it, and it surprisingly didn't have a big trajectory. It was only like a couple of feet or something. So I don't know, there might be a whole kind of new thing in ensembles where an ensemble is created based on how far the spit goes. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Brass bands are out for a while then, I think. <laughs> Yeah. Well, well, Jack Adler's got, Jack Adler McKean's got a question, so I don't know, maybe. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting point. Um, I, I think to, to try and be a little bit more serious than I've been for the last hour, um, I think that there is a, in the same way that a lot of people are saying, look, I really enjoyed reading, I've not been reading for a while. I, I'm not trying to kind of say that nothing we do at the moment can be immensely useful to learn from. Um, and, and clearly, you know, um, teaching an instrument or a voice online has meant that teachers have really had to, and students actually, have had to really think differently about the way they communicate. And I think there could be something really interesting for myself as a composer in this process to, to think about it, that maybe I will be thinking about an ensemble in a, in a different way. Um, so yeah, yeah, there is, there is that. But yeah, it's an interesting question. Absolutely, yeah. And um, yeah, I saw the Berlin Phil the, the other day, you know, where they, they kind of had just like a few people on the stage. It's interesting. Thank you. I, I want to, to bring in, in Jenny in a second, but there's some, I think Nina has something that is relevant to what we're talking about. Nina, are you here? She was there, but um, she certainly put in a link. That yes, we... I am here. <laughs> you are here. Do you want to say a word before I bring in Jenny? Oh, oh! I just put it's a silly link. It's a, a series, a little series that I've been making in the in during lockdown, uh, called Noises with Nina, and that one features a lot of recorders. So I thought it might be relevant to the conversation right now, um, and it's just been a way for me to to do some creative work that. Um, has quite instantaneous results and uh, keeps me sane or or completely mad, <laughs> whichever way you look at it um, in the current situation. <laughs> I think I have seen that on, on Facebook. Some <laughs> yeah. of that. It'd be lovely, it'd be really interesting to hear of other examples of that, of those sorts of projects that people are are, are doing to, to keep themselves sort of sane, but in a creative way. Um, I've, been, I've been watching Noises with Nina, of course. I think it's great. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. I mean, it's also, it, I mean, I've actually got quite a few flutes around the house and I'm, I'm not going to kind of subject you to any more, but one of my favourites is actually a Thai flute, which divides the octave into eight equal tones. And it's absolutely fabulous. But some of your ones, Nina, have been kind of, it's literally like what's in the house. And I imagine in many cases, um, you know, I mean, this in the best possible way, you might not give them the light of day. And now in this kind of situation, you're kind of thinking about, okay, how does this work? How does this sound? I have to say, I spent much more time on my flutes than I ever would have. Great, can we have Jenny? Can you unmute you yourself? Yeah, sorry, thank you. Um, I've got a trombone lesson going on in the background. So just, uh, I don't know if you can hear that, please ignore if you can. <laughs> um, uh, I'm really interesting, David. Thanks so much for that. And um, I'm just fascinated by the connection um, and the similarities with Javanese gamelan. Because as you know, I play Javanese gamelan, and it's not just the lagu batin and the inner melody, but the you know the the notion of resonance and how the resonance of the instruments work together, and the placement of the instruments based on the resonance and the reflections of the instruments. So the whole thing is made up through you know reflection this sort of like inner core um, and 
one of the things that one of the reasons why I play Javanese gamelan and and I really love it is the physicality of it and when you're in the middle of that it's such an experience you know when you've got the big gongs going and and the whole thing is moving and you really move with the music and and so I was just thinking about the relationship between the composer and the performers in in the physical space so you've been talking about the 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 resonance and the sonic space but um you know the physicality has been completely taken away of course but um i just i'd just be interested to to hear you talk a little bit about that physicality um and how you use that as a composer yeah i mean like a, a number of composers have said this but often when we're writing a piece like this or a chamber piece um in normal situations we often imagine the venue in which it might be played. We think about the space. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone. It's, it's like you almost you write a note and you almost imagine it being there in the concert hall. And I don't think that's a vain thing. I, I don't think it's just, just thinking kind of like, oh, we're big composers getting performed. It's because it really informs what we're writing. Um, and it, indeed, it's fair to say that, that one of the things that many of us learn as we write each piece and hear it is how different things work in different spaces. Um, a, a lot of these kind of, they're almost like kind of old sayings that you remember when you were learning an instrument, but they're really true. Sometimes if you play something slower, it sounds faster. <laughs> it, it all just depends on, on, on the whole. So, um, and at the same time, it's also fair to say that, that my thought process that goes into writing a quartet is very different to an orchestral piece. In an orchestral piece, I'm still thinking very spatially. It's a different kind of space where I think with a quartet, it's definitely more intimate. Um, I think I'll probably stick with intimate instruments actually after that. Um, yeah, I, I'm thinking how they interact. And I have to say, that's the thing that, that I'm really missing because even in our sessions together, you know, people are in their living rooms or in their bedrooms and it's, I, I miss that, that kind of feedback, even in the recording. Um, so yeah, I, I think for a lot of us, we really we really think about that sense of space, um, and it, it's some something also that, like in orchestral writing, you're often aware that you might be connecting two instruments, whereas in reality they will never hear each other in the whole. Um, so some of this is actually an artificial construct as well. Whereas if you're writing something like a string quartet, you you know you're writing for a group that really knows each other, they they understand how they 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 work together. Bye, Michelle, wish Duncan a happy birthday. Um, and that's a very, very kind of different thing. Um, so some of it's actually artificial. I, th I think that's that's a good case in point. It's a little bit like sometimes when I see cues and parts, it's like, are you really sure that player will hear that cue? <laughs> you know? um, I'm not sure that that answers the question sufficiently, but. but we Sorry. Had that, um, <laughs> are you okay, Jenny? Do you want to come back in? Yeah, sorry, I, I was just going to say it's, you know, so you're in, it's the same thing. So when you're in the gamelan, you're kind of like going at your thing and you can physically feel that it's right and it's working. So there's there's a real physicality about the, connect, you know, you're connecting to things that you can't necessarily hear. But the the way the, the, the resonance works is the vibrations all work together and you can physically feel that there's to, to, I take Javanese gamelans into prisons and there's one theory that it's that resonance that produces a really calming effect that has a therapeutic effect, for example. But um it's it's I just wondered whether, you know, that you know, that detail of the physical feeling of the performer is something that you, well, you know, you're talking about turning pages and things, but whether yeah. the, the real inner sort of, um, I don't really know how to describe it, but you know what I mean. <laughs> no, that's, that's really interesting. Um, um, yeah. I think Jack, Jack Adler McKean had his hand up at one point as well. Thanks, Jay. That's really, really fascinating. So do you want to slip Jack in? Yeah. Jack, are you here? Hi, yeah, I'm here. Thanks. Um, this debate on on um, with old instruments is interesting because I've been working with a composer for a long time now on a new piece for Serpent, which is a, an instrument which inherently has very little fixed intonation. And and this and also you talking got me thinking about the idea of the rather subjective terms you've used of, of in or out of tune. Uh, and it particularly brought to my mind how you'd approach um, writing for instruments where there really isn't 
much of what you could say in or out of tune. These instruments which weren't designed to play 12 note equal temperament. I, I was lucky enough to improvise uh, last week with um, a musician playing both a theremin and also a, a continuum keyboard. I don't know if you know this instrument, but it's an extraordinary piece of kit where you can program a keyboard to basically play any tuning of any note and any scale or any instrument you like. Um, so I'm interested to hear how you would appreciate how would approach writing for those instruments where there is isn't really something to break out of in that sense. It's it's more um, working within an instrument that can do anything you like. Well, I mean, you could argue, depending on the performer, that the human voice is that malleable, Ex except that obviously the tradition of, of Western classical singing thinks in a different way. Um, and it's also in terms of where I kind of come from aesthetically, it's it's relatively conservative and, and quite traditional in that I kind of like breaking a little part of something which is actually relatively straightforward. Um, I'm trying to think of what I've, I've never written for something like a theremin or, or something where pitch is incredibly um, malleable. The continuum of fingerboard, if you don't know, is is an extraordinary instrument that I can I can recommend looking up. It's it's kind of like a theremin, except that you have finger control, so you mm. you can have that flexibility of pitch, but also very precise control using a, a touch sensitive keypad. Oh, um, so in terms of pitch, that's similar to Nonde Martino, because Nonde Martino. Yeah, so it is it is essentially like a modern Nonde Martino, except mm. that rather than producing one tombo, you can program it to produce any tombo you like. Yeah. And you can also change articulation and, yeah. Right, okay. Oh, that, that, I mean, that, that definitely sounds really interesting. I mean, similarly, because I'm a pianist, I think you always have that sense of frustration with pitch because you can't do much with it. And so that's why, for instance, when I, I've written quite a lot of contratanti works for piano. So I've been really interested in how you actually make the piano sound out of chip. Um, yeah. I've got a piano quintet like that, where, where actually it's all about the strings make the piano sound bad. Uh, a bit like the Ligeti. I mean, I mean, bad in a good way. And you're right that I was being subjective, but I have to be really clear. I, it's a hard thing to, in a rehearsal sometime, convey to the player, but I'm never using out of tune in a negative sense. I'm, I'm actually thinking of it expressively because we can't play in time and we can't play in tune. And I really mean that. And I think there's, there's something quite wonderful and expressive about exploring that. It's just that the way I do it is, is through a relatively kind of conservative medium of pitch notation, if that makes sense. I, I think that in, in recent decades, the, the composer that I think has done this most interestingly is probably Georg Ludwig Haas. And his use of, um, "Quote unquote detuned instruments is is extraordinarily expressive." I just had one other very quick question on a completely different tangent. I just wondered if you'd heard the um, uh, Musica Eterna Taylor Corensis recording of Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony. Because I have, it, I, ha I, I, I think you suggested it. I think it, I did. Yeah, it's it's the only one that quite gets there. It's still a recording, but yeah, yeah, it absolutely gets there. Um, but I, I still I still think it doesn't matter. You have to hear it live. But, yeah. but you did suggest, I think we had that conversation and, and yeah, it gets really close, really close. I think that's the one I was mentioning. Right. Thank so, you. Yeah, thanks. Amanda's got her hand up. Hi, yes. Have I unmuted myself? Yes. No, you're fine. Hi, Amanda. Um, hi. Uh, actually, following on from what Jack was just saying about um, pitch, um, obviously, I inhabit the world of you know, uh, unequal temperament, etc. So um, the whole idea of pitch, um, but what I've noticed uh, doing the, the daily musette recordings is that I'm, I'm only tuning to myself, I'm only tuning to my drones, etc. Um, so that raises the problem of if I were to try and edit any of these videos, which I, I'm not, but um, if I were, that would create an extra uh, sort of problem because one snip, one clip is not necessarily at the same pitch as the next because I might have tuned in between. But then there's also the problem that as a performer it raises, which is that when I record, and not in a sort of recording session where you've kind of psyched yourself up, but um, as soon as I record, there's an element of creativity that goes out the window because I'm aware of having to 
do something the same in case it needs to be stitched together or you know stick to the the which is obviously it goes completely against the grain of live performance and I wondered if there's any correlation in that with composition are you aware that you're sort of pre-programming almost I think it depends a little bit on on the composer and actually how much they're recorded I mean obviously all of us have recordings but maybe someone who's who's actually thinking a lot of the time, oh, I'm writing this for recording, I'm writing that, they may think slightly differently. I mean, what you raise is, is not so different to the point that uh, Robert Levin made a long time ago, um, gosh, late 80s or something. He said that one of the problems with his approach to say performing a Mozart concerto is it made it really hard for people to edit because he might play it in one octave and then play it in another. Um, now the antidote to that is perhaps having more live recordings and of course, that's the reality. I, I mm. think that in the, it's something I've, I've said before, but the recording industry for classical music, for anything actually, but for classical music, it's in such a state of flux. You know, we, we have Spotify, we can, we can access a million recordings immediately. Therefore, I think we lionize a particular recording less. Mm. Whereas in the eighties, you know, I'd go to whatever the music shop was called then, but I forget the name for that, and I'd buy a cassette and it cost six pounds and that was really expensive. And that's the only cassette I'd have of that piece. Yeah. So, you know, Brahms one particular recording. Mm. Now that's that's all completely changed. And I actually think that we're, we're much more used now to, to loving live performances. I act, actually, even as a kid, I, I used to record of Radio 3 all the time. Um, mm. The recording that I grew up with, with Boulez Notation, was actually a live performance of Barenboim conducting it in the Usher Hall of all places during the Edinburgh Festival. And it was Radio 3 and I recorded it and that was the one I, I listened to. Yeah. yeah. Mine was um, Prokofiev's uh, um, Romeo and Juliet recorded by the Bolshoi. Um, and there's one, one's one point where the violins get so excited they overshoot massively. First violins go about at least a quarter tone too high. And it's brilliant. It's just, it really brings it to life. Right. Thank you. Um, I think we have a, a, a we have a question from Daniel. I've got it here. So, Daniel, yeah. Daniel says, "Is there a way do you think to recreate the live blending one we get in a live performance in a virtual online performance? Is it a case of overdoing it in the online version to override the artificial construct, i.e., each player recording with more reverb, for example?" Then Dan says he's currently writing a large-scale lockdown piece, but he's taking a different approach in that he's gone away from using online tech. And then he'll tell me more about it when we, when we next speak. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting point. Um, I mean, I'm actually a little bit worried by how relatively easy I could manipulate those separate tracks. And, and I would rather be writing something which is a little bit more dangerous. By the way, I've actually got a president, one of my own pieces was actually recorded this way. About 18 years ago, the Associated Board um, commissioned three composers to write pieces that they wanted to have for educational purposes. So I wrote a five minute piece for the Britain Symphonia, so about 18 instruments. It was actually conducted by, by Jimmy McMillan. And he conducted them all and they recorded it. And then they recorded every player separately playing to a video of Jimmy conducting. And I thought this is the most nuts thing I've ever heard of. But then when they put the whole piece together, it was like, wow, that actually works. And it was because they had it on a website. It was called Sound Junction. Unfortunately, it's not up anymore. But what, what, what people could do is they could listen to just the flute or just the flute and the horn or just the horn and the bassoon or the whole thing or all the strings. And actually, it was an amazing idea. Um, but at the same time, I, I think to, to answer Dan's question, I would rather explore the, the slightly, I don't want to say less slick, but I think that's what worries me a little bit about it. I, I would like to have more problems. Yeah. I think Jenny has got a question and I wonder whether we need to wrap up really yeah. by, um, so that we're finished by, by six o'clock, but Jenny. Jenny, are you here? No, no question from Jenny. I thought I got another another request no okay anybody else for a final question um so that leaves me i think nobody's put their hand up i can't see all the screens but i'd really like to thank you david with great enthusiasm and now i can say it and you're not having to hear me a hundred times echoing um it's it's great to get this um off the off 
uh, you know, going this term. And amazing to see that we've got many more people joining us. Um, the, at least 60 on Zoom and probably more on um, elsewhere. That's fantastic and we need to keep that going. So you really have, have set the mark quite high for us um, and, and also raised an issue that we will be coming back to um, certain weeks to looking at the role of the, the lockdown. And Sam Duffy is going to be presenting her research in a couple of weeks time, which is fantastic. But I just want to say that next week we have Dr. Jenny Henley, who's with us, has been talking to us, our director of, of programs, who's going to be talking about redefining excellence and inclusion. I'm um, really looking forward to that. And we'll give out more details in this little blurb and we'll try and get the publicity going. Marketing are helping us. But just to say that this is um, a lovely way to create community and it, it shows that we can do that. And I, I can see faces of people who are in different parts of Europe and probably in different parts of the world. So let's try and keep this going. And David, thank you for a fascinating talk. We, we learned a lot from it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure. And lovely to see all of you as well. It's great. Thank you. Let's see you next week, okay? Come back. Bye-bye, <laughs> see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.